thank you guys. Thank you so much. That's such a, that's such a blessing and such an encouragement to us uh, for what the Lord would say to us, what he does, how he speaks to us. And you, you guys always do wonderful. And, uh, you know, a lot of times I, I think people, I don't know really what all they think about about worship and, and music before the message. You know, I've been in, been a pastor for 47 years and, uh, you know, I've been in, in, in lots of churches and uh, I know there are a lot of different attitudes about, about worship and about music and so forth. And I, I think a lot of times the reason people aren't blessed any more than they are in the, in the, the worship time or even if it's hymns or whatever, whatever the music might be, uh, because you look at it as a prelude to the message. I mean, it's like, okay, this is the warm-up act for the message. It's coming. It's kind of get us in a little spirit, you know, kind of get us thinking about the right things. But if you, and if you look at it like that, you're never going to get it. Uh, you're never going to get what it's intended to be because there is uh, basically worship and praise is just the word of God put to rhythm and melody. That's, about, that's really about all that it is. And it gives you an opportunity to release yourself and to express yourself maybe in ways that uh, you can't just do when you're listening and you're sitting and somebody's presenting material to you and so forth because you all have good manners and you don't want to, you know, interrupt and you don't want the pastor to tell you to sit down or whatever, you know, and embarrass everybody and all that kind of stuff. But anyway, thank you. You guys participate well and, and, and the group, uh, our team, woo, outstanding is all I can say. I'm telling you there. So good, so good. I'm starting a three-week series today on <clears throat> a very simple and straightforward word here. Uh, this word, well, I guess all three of them have the potential to be uh, conviction-producing for you. Uh, this one today, I think, particularly has uh, the potential to be very, uh, uh, to kind of crush you a little bit. Uh, because you're going to feel guilty as soon as I start talking about these things because we're all guilty of this all the time. We're not careful with what I'm going to be talking to you today about. We haven't been careful, and we need, there, there are a lot of backtracking we need to do, and we have even ourselves been hurt by what I'm talking about today, and you may have to forgive somebody that's even gone on to be with the Lord to get over this. And it's very, it's very simple now, very simple, and it's straightforward, and it's absolute truth, I believe, from the Word of God. Everybody knows, everybody in this building, all you guys out there know that we are in a battle, and that's not news to you. And that the Bible says that this battle is a spiritual battle. It calls it warfare, actually. And one thing you need to have when you're in, in war is you need to have a strategic plan for victory. In other words, what are you going to do in order to win this battle that you're in because you can't afford to lose this thing. This is critical for you. It's critical for your family, for your happiness, your future, your joy. I'm not talking about losing your salvation or something like that. I'm just talking about having an abundant life. Uh, living an abundant purpose for God and not being defeated in, this, in these spiritual issues of your life that constantly keep you depressed and disoriented and discouraged and all of those kind of things because we, we are in this battle and we have an enemy that is very serious about this battle. And so these three messages I'm going to share, one each week, <clears throat> will give us basically three steps to victory. I know that's not an original title and it's not very sexy or exciting, um, but it's these three, if you do these three things, you, you can have victory in this battle. If you don't do these three things, you're not going to win. That's just all it is to it. You're going to be defeated, and that's not where you want to be. That's not where you want your family to be, children or grandchildren or any of your lineage to be. You want it to be victorious. So the first step is the first is the title of the first message today, and that is I know you some of you that have the outline, and some of you that can read the screen up here. You see that it is the, the it, it's the, the first step. The first is stop believing lies. Now, see how simple that is? 
Stop believing lies. I, I, of course, being a pastor many years and being at an altar at the end of services and we would invite people to come and pray or come to Christ. And I mean, all kinds of things at the altar that we ask people to do and come if you want to do this or have this. Uh, many times as a pastor or a revivalist or anybody that's in, uh, in any spiritual authority in the service, you, you're in the altar and people sometimes come up to you and ask you to pray for them. And this happens all the time, and it's amazing what people will ask you to pray about. And I'm not mocking any of that. I'm just saying there's just a multitude of things. But one, one of the things, and this is, was pretty, this is kind of a common type thing, someone would come up and say, Pastor, would you pray for me? And then, of course, my response is, well, uh, what should I pray for you? What is it about? And, and uh, this particular lady said, uh, uh, the devil is lying to me. Satan is lying to me. And I said, all right, let me get this straight. You know it's Satan, and you know it's a lie. So what is it? Why should I pray? <laughs> I mean, you know it's Satan, and you know it's a lie. So what, what would you like for me to pray for you? Why would you want me to pray? And she said, well, when you put it like that, I guess, yeah, I guess I don't need you to. And I said, well, let me make a suggestion that the reason you're down here is not because you don't know that it's Satan and you don't know that he's lying to you. What you're saying is you're starting to believe those lies. They're, you're starting to accept those lies. So I'm gonna pray for you that you would see these lies for what they are and you would be able to reject them and not be seduced to believe that these things are true. Let me give you a refrigerator verse and those of you that have your, the outline, the handout, you've got it, it's the last little line in the top paragraph. Uh, you, I, I think you, you might wanna write this on an index card or whatever you think creatively and put it on your refrigerator so you can see it every day and it is this, the first step to sin is believing a lie. Let me say that again. I don't say too many profound things, but I think this is a profound thing. This is a tweet deal here. Um, <laughs> the first step to vic uh, the first step to sin is believing a lie. Now let me show you where this started. We'll go back to the beginning in Genesis chapter three. In Genesis chapter three, in verse one, now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, has God indeed said you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? Now, just so you'll know what God did say, I will put up Genesis two. This is what God actually said to them. In Genesis, it's in Genesis 2, 15. Then the Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to tend it and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man saying, of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it you shall surely die. Now, the reason I wanted you to see that, and this might not be a big deal to you at all, it's really not, you know, it's not a, hang your salvation on, but I just wanted you to see how from the very start, how Satan was coming at his deceit with this, uh, with this expanded negative kind of a statement. He, he came from that negative side implying that something was wrong to start with. Has God said that you can't eat from every tree in this garden? Come on, man. I mean, God's trying to limit you. He said you couldn't eat from every tree of the garden. But what God actually said is you can eat of every tree of the garden. The only exception is that one right out there in the midst of the garden. Stay away from that one, every other tree. So God says it positively and Satan says it negatively, which is a really great form of a master liar, actually. But let's go on with what actually happens in this thing. In verse two of Genesis three, and the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it. <laughs> That's an expansion. I'm sure Adam told her that. Lest you die. Because remember, God didn't speak to Eve. He spoke to Adam. Eve wasn't even created when God said that to Adam. So Eve got her information secondhand, and I'm sure Adam said, well, I might better take, you know, don't want her to get, even buy it, so I'll just tell her, don't even touch it, you know. 
Uh, so she says, it, yeah, right, lest you die. Then the serpent said to the woman, you shall not surely die. So there it is. I'm sure you see the lie, right? God said, you will die. Satan said, you will not die. God is lying to you. And remember, the first step to sin is believing a lie. How many times have you said to yourself after some particularly uh, hard incident or a uh, negative deal that happened to you in some way. You idiot. You've said that to yourself. You idiot. How could you be so dumb? You always do that. You never get this right. You can't learn that. You're too old. You can't do that. Maybe if you were younger, you, and, and, I mean, what kind of lies have you been telling yourself about yourself? How do you know if something's a lie? Well, I'm going to give you a very simple little deal, and when I say it, you're going to you're going to have to you're going to say that doesn't make any sense, Pastor. But let me explain it to you, okay? All right. Here's how you know if something's a lie. You know something's a lie if it doesn't surprise you. My dad. This is a story now. My dad's on with the Lord, so don't. I'm not telling you, this is just an illustration. My dad has cancer. But that doesn't surprise us because his dad died with cancer and my granddad died with cancer. And we've always been afraid that my dad was gonna be the next one in line. My mom uh, is, is getting a heart catheter the doctor thinks that she has heart disease. But that doesn't surprise us because her mom had a heart attack when she was very young. And so we always thought mom would, mom would, would have a heart attack one day. So when it doesn't surprise you, you have believed a lie. Now I'm not saying, please don't, Get me wrong, and I might need to make you repeat this. And you guys online. I am not saying that there are not some natural things that happen to people that follow a family lineage or a genetic issue. I'm not saying that at all. I'm just saying that it is amazing how often we swallow a lie, hook, line, and sinker, that is a lie. You last time I checked, have been adopted into a new family, right? We, we, we belong to a kingdom now. And we belong to a kingdom family. And it is not normal for a kingdom family to suffer these kinds of things. Kingdom kids do not suffer all of these kind of things and it is not normal for them to, be, to have these things. So what I'm talking about in essence is we keep a door open in our life. You know, we have an enemy and our enemy wants to, wants to inhabit our life. He wants to torment us, torture us. He wants to run in and out of our life. And we allow him to do this when we leave a door open in our life. So he can do this. And one of the ways that we leave a door open in our life is believe a lie. And it invites him in. So let me give you three ways that we leave a door open in our life for Satan to come in and out and attack us and torment us and torture us. And, 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 uh, preclude us from the abundant living life God wants us to have. All right, here it goes. Number one, first way, by the sins that we continue. If you're gonna persist in sin, and you know it's a sin, and you do nothing about it even though you can, you're opening a door for the enemy 
to come in and out of your life at any time and torment and torture you in any way he possibly can. So let me answer a question that I probably can see in your eyes. Uh, as soon as I said, if you persist in a sin, in the sins we continue, if you persist in a sin, I know the first thing many of you thought was some big carnal sin of the flesh that, you know, you're doing, I don't know, uh, drinking, you know, too much, uh, smoking, chewing tobacco, uh, sex, lust, greed, uh, what? I mean, just name it. And, and I know that's the first, we, we think, when we think about sin, that's the kind of stuff we think about. And we think, okay, well, I'm not really doing that. And, and, or maybe you're saying, oh man, I, you know, uh, that, that's, that's, I, I, need to st- I need to stop all that. Let's take, let's, instead of thinking about that kind of sin, let's think about one that's a little more subtle and really far more damaging actually than any of those. Let's think about a sin like unforgiveness. You want to, here's what Paul said about unforgiveness. This is in 2 Corinthians 2. Here's what he said. Now whom you forgive anything, I also forgive. For if indeed I have forgiven anything, I have forgiven that one for your sakes in the presence of Christ. Lest Satan should take advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. This is saying simply, if you hold on to unforgiveness, Satan is coming in to your life and he's going to take advantage of you. Unforgiveness is one of those devices. A device here, scripturally, means an inclination. It means uh, an attitude of mind. It means Satan has a a plan and a method and he uses tools that, that the scripture identifies as devices. And unforgiveness is one of the devices that he uses so often to put a chalk in that door that we are so prone not to even notice so that he can come in and out of our life at any time. I can remember many times laying awake at night. I'm laying awake strategizing about something that somebody said to me that hit me the wrong way. Or maybe they did something, and I'm thinking, you know, how can I get them back? Now, I know none of you spiritual people do this, because I can tell by the way you're looking at me, you're all spiritual, and you don't do these things. But some of us do. And I roll this thing around in my mind, and I practice what I'm going to say the next time I see that person. By the way, let me just let you in on this. If you, if you rehearse something over and over and over, you haven't forgiven it, <laughs> okay, <laughs> all right? If you forgive something, you can let it go, all right? If you truly have forgiven something, you can let it go. And, and, I, and, 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 and I know because I, I'm so prone, I mean, I don't know what it is about my old nature, but my old nature has a hard time with letting stuff go. And God had to teach me some big lessons about forgiving people and I've had lots of opportunity to forgive and but when you truly forgive something you you can you can let it go and here's what satan tells you to keep you from letting it go he says if you release that person then nothing's going to happen to them right first of all it's not your responsibility what happens to them It's God's responsibility. And second of all, if you don't forgive, something's going to happen to you. And I hear you, I hear you, but they were wrong. They did me wrong. They said it wrong. They were wrong, 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 wrong. Well, of course they're wrong. That's why you have to forgive them. If they're right, you don't need to forgive somebody that's right. 
Only those that are wrong. If somebody's right, you know what you should do? Take what they said, make an adjustment to what they said, be blessed by what they said, even if it hurts you a little bit. If it's true, it's true. And then move on with life. But, but, but I don't want to forgive them because I want them to hurt like I've hurt. But if I don't forgive them, what the scripture says is that I'm leaving a door open in my life for the enemy to roam in and out of any time he wants to torment me in life. We leave a door open by the sins that we continue. Pride's another one. Greed's another one. No, guilt, lust, that's name them right on down the line. Uh, all I'm saying is you don't have to be a gutter dragon, alcoholic, uh, internet porn hog, uh, sex offender to, to be involved in sin and for it to be very serious in your life as an open door that the enemy is going to take advantage of. He is going to take advantage of. And he has been taken advantage of. And just when things go in right in your life and you're happy, all of a sudden he swivels in because the door's open and has a whale of a time up in there. And you have invited him into this. Here's the second way we keep the door open. By the words that we speak. Now this is where you're going to get hammered a little bit. By the words that we speak. Now, please understand me again. I'm, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to present truth to you, and, and it's going to be solid. But I'm not talking about things that we play with each other about. I'm not talking about innocent chatter, about insignificant things. I'm not talking about, uh, you know, sometimes you have to say things in a harder way to someone. I'm not talking about these kind of things. I'm just, I'm talking about these, these, these words that we speak that bring uh, uh, a domination, that bring a spirit with it, that bring, a, that bring something that stays, that endures, and I know you've had some of these yourselves. You've been, words have been spoken to you or about you or around you that you heard and you received them and they have affected your life. So let me show you why this happens and what, what we do about it. Proverbs 18, verse 21. Every person that's ever talking about, talked about words we speak has quoted this passage. Look at it, Proverbs 18. Death and life are in the power of the tongue and those who love it, and I put respect it because that's what it means, and those who respect it will eat its fruit. So when you use your tongue, the power of death and life is in your tongue. And whichever way you go with it, it's, you're going to eat what, what you create. Is what it's saying. Now, some people take this verse way too far. They go out in the twilight zone and they say or imply that we human beings have the power to create with our tongues. That when we say a word, we actually create an incident or create life or create death. So may I say to you, as sweetly as I can, you don't have the power to create anything. Only God has the power to create things. You do not have the power to create things, and I can prove it to you. I have done it many times. I have said, I want a red Corvette in my driveway when I go out. And guess what? There is no red Corvette in my driveway when I go out because I don't create things with my tongue. Here, let me tell you what this verse does mean. What this verse means is with my tongue, I can agree with the one who has creative power or I can agree with the one who has destructive power. 
I can agree with my tongue on life or I can agree with my tongue on death. I can agree with God with my tongue or I can agree with Satan with my tongue. I have the right for the words I say and I agree with to either speak life or to speak death. But only God has the power to create. So you agree with your tongue over God's words over you, or you agree with your tongue the words that Satan has spoken about you, and whichever one you choose, you're gonna eat the fruit of it. Here's Proverbs 6. Proverbs 6, verse 2. You are snared by the words of your mouth. Now, all us country people know what a snare is, right? A snare is a trap. It's used most often by animal hunters to trap an unsuspecting animal. It's hidden. It's camouflaged. It catches the animal by surprise. It holds the animal against its will. And it, and it holds it in, de, in, in defeat, in dominance. It, it, it doesn't let it go. So Proverbs is saying that we often are trapped by the words that we speak. We are held in captivity by the words that we speak. We're held against our will by words that we speak because they snare us and they catch us without us even knowing they're coming or seeing where they came from. We're careless with our words. Now let me show you how words can bind you and how words can be broken. Very simple passage, five verses. I don't know how many of you have ever read the book of Numbers, hopefully you have. And if you did, I don't know if you noticed these verses, but let me just share them with you. This is Numbers chapter 30, first five verses. Then Moses spoke to the head of the tribes concerning the children of Israel, saying, this is the thing which the Lord has commanded. If a man makes a vow to the Lord or swears an oath to bind himself by some agreement, he shall not break his word, he shall do according to all that proceeds out of his mouth. Or if a woman makes a vow to the Lord and binds herself by some agreement while in her father's house in her youth. So I think clearly you can see this is talking about someone who is under someone else's authority. You, you're aware of authority, right? That God, men, God holds us accountable for our families. We're the authority. If something happens in my house, I'm the one that's going to be held accountable. So I'm the authority. If you don't have a dad, then mom's the authority. Stepmom, stepdad, whoever, grandpa, who, whoever's the authority over the home, that's who it's talking about. So you got a young person in a home in this verse, and they, uh, they, they're about to do something, and it's going to tell you what to do. Verse 4. And her father, and this young people in their father's house in her youth, and her father hears her vow and the agreement by which she has bound herself, and her father holds his peace, then all her vows shall stand, and every agreement with which she has bound herself shall stand. But if her father overrules her on the day that he hears, then none of her vows nor her agreements by which she has bound herself shall stand, and the Lord will release her because her father has overruled her. Now, I don't want this to sound spooky. This is, there's nothing spooky about this. There's no big, gigantic, dramatic ceremony that we're going to go through and unbind things that have been said. I just want to read you, and I just want to read that to you so that you could know that. God has a process for breaking these bondage-producing words 
that have been spoken over us because Satan lies to us and these words are bondage words and they're part of his lies. And the one who has authority has the power to break these words. All right, so what are we talking about? Well, think about the things that, have been, that were spoken to you as a child, if you can. Just reflect. Just, I guarantee you most of you have at least one or two things that you can remember that your parents said to you or your aunts or your siblings or somebody said to you that just bound you up. You still think about it. When things get tight or you get in the right circumstance, that word just pops right back in your mind. You're stupid. Why can't you ever get it right? Are you that dumb? You're never going to make it. I mean, words like this. And then think about how many words you've spoken over your children or grandchildren that are words like this. You're so accident prone. You're always having trouble. You're never going to make it. You always blow it. You could never do anything right. I tell you what I heard in a grocery store one day. I'm standing in line. There's a, a sweet mom, Tristan, like about, that has a beautiful daughter like you do. Just gorgeous little thing. And she's riding in the buggy, and the, and the mom was pushing the buggy, and an older lady is back behind, and then I'm back, back behind that. And this older lady, sweet as she can be, I know she doesn't mean anything negative by this. She didn't have any agenda. It's just the way people do. This is what I'm talking about. And she looked at that little child, and she was kind of goo-gooing with it, and, she looked, and the mother looked at her, and she said, oh, your daughter is so beautiful. But I, I know when she gets to be a teenager, she's going to break your heart. Now, what is that? You just put a curse on my child. What is my child going to do to me when she gets 13? And these are the words that we speak. Now, what had to happen... I don't know what actually happened with that one, but what would, should have happened was when the mother took the little girl out to the automobile, got, got stuff in there, she should have got the little thing on the front seat and said, now baby, you know, someone just said that when you were a teenager, you were gonna break mama's heart. But I just want you to know that that is not true, that, that we're praying for you to come to the Lord and that you're gonna have the mind of Christ one day and the Holy Spirit's going to live in you, and you are not going to break mama's heart, and that is not true. You don't need to jump up like a samurai and go, ah, I rebuke you in Jesus' name, you know, right in the grocery store. Just take care of it. You're the authority, and, and handle that and say, look, you know, that is not, not, that's not, that's not right. Because when you have the mind of Christ, and you have the Holy Spirit living in you, what does Jesus say the Holy Spirit is? Jesus said when he left here, he said, I'm gonna send the Holy Spirit to be in you and to be with you. And I have, this is just startling to me. Jesus said to them, I have many things to say to you that I can't say. You can't understand them. They fly right over, Whoop. Not going to be profitable for you. I have many things to say to you that I can't say. But when he, the spirit of truth comes, he will lead you into all things. What does all mean? It means all, right? All right, when I say all things, what am I meaning? All spiritual things, all mechanical things, all computer things, all uh, recreational things. I mean, all is all, Right? So what Jesus just said is, we're going to have a spirit living in us that knows everything about everything. And if he knows everything about everything and he lives in us and he is for us and he is our comforter and our, and, and, and our spirit that goes with us to drive us and move us toward God's purpose, why don't we talk to him and just say, Holy Spirit, you know what? I don't do good in math and I need to know math. So teach me math. 
You know everything. Teach me how to do this. Open me up so I can learn this. I don't know how to rear my children. I don't know what to do. I'm confused. And go. Ask the Holy Spirit. He's God. I don't know if you feel funny talking to the Holy Spirit. You know, we renamed him, right? We gave him a new name so he's more personal, right? What did we name him, Bill? Was that it? No, it wasn't Bill. It was Joe or something. And we said Joey and Joseph. And so that way he's more personal and you don't feel like you're talking to an it. You, you, you realize it's, he's a him. He is God the Holy, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. What's his name? God. What's his description? He's the Holy Spirit. What's his description? He's the Son. What's his description? He's the Father. But who is he? God, God, God. You can talk to him. You're not, you're not talking to an idol. Holy Spirit, help me straighten this mess out. We need to pay attention to those things that happen and we need to overrule these negative words concerning those to whom God has given us accountability. My children should not suffer from bondage producing words that have been spoken over them. I am their father. I pay attention to what's said and I break those words as soon as I hear them because they are not true. They are lies. Stop believing lies. I'm telling you that words you can speak can keep you in bondage and it's very clear in scripture and the reason that the words we speak keep us in bondage is because Jesus said in Luke 6 that those words reflect our heart. Look at what it says. A good man out of, the good, out of the good treasure of his heart speaks forth good. And an evil man out of the evil treasure of his heart brings forth evil. For out of the abundance of the heart, his mouth speaks. Words are very important because they reflect what you believe in your heart. And how did those words get in your heart? You believed a lie. Somebody probably spoke them to you. Somebody told you you would never make it. You're no good. Or, or worse. So we need to be careful. We must be careful with our words because the Bible is the truth. And if we'll speak the truth to people, they'll be set free. Satan won't have a chance to go in and out. All right, there's, I told you there are three ways. Here's the third one. All right, the sins we continue, the words we speak, and now third, the thoughts we think. The thoughts that we think. I mean, how in the world does that have, have any thoughts that we think have anything to do with spiritual battles that I fight? Well, look at Proverbs 6. Oh, excuse me, Proverbs 23, verse 7. For as he thinks in his heart, so is he. We often quote that, as a man thinks in his own heart, so is he. It's just saying, if you think you're accident prone, you are accident prone. If you think you're dumb, <laughs> you are dumb. If you think that you're capable, then you are capable. That what you think in your heart is what you are. And it is amazing. I'm, next week, I'm going to be talking about the next, the next step in this battle. And it's going to have just a little bit to do with the mind. And I've been studying the mind all this past week. Tanya said, are you preaching that this week? I said, no. She said, well, what are you doing this week? Because you've been studying that the whole week. But it's just so intriguing. Man, the power of the mind is unbelievable. And what God does, and it, it, is, it is amazing how often what we believe is true affects what is true in our life. It's almost like a, a self-fulfilling prophecy. 
here, Jesus said it this way, John 8. Jesus said, and you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. So follow me here, follow me here. If you shall know the truth and the truth will make you free, what will a lie do? A lie, yep, keeps you in bondage. So Numbers 18, the children of Israel are standing at Kadesh Barnea, a wide spot in the road. There's the promised land. God says, go in and get it. And they send 12 spies into the land. Ten of them come back with a negative report. Two of them, Joshua and Caleb, come back with a positive report that says, if God tells us to go in there, who can stand against us? Let's go in and possess the land. But of course, the people received the majority report. And I want you to hear the words they say in, in verse 32 of chapter 18, uh, chapter 13 of Numbers. And they gave the children of Israel a bad report of the land which they had spied out, saying, the land through which we have gone as spies is a land that devours its inhabitants. And all the people who we saw in it are men of great stature. There we saw giants. The descendants of Anak came from the giants. And we were like grasshoppers in our own sight. And so we were in their sight. Now, do you see how important what you think about yourself is here? Do you see what they're saying here? They're saying, we see ourselves as grasshoppers in their sight, and they see us as grasshoppers in their sight because we think of ourselves as being grasshoppers, our enemy thinks of us as grasshoppers. Every good liar shares a little bit of the truth. Now, I will tell you, Satan is a masterful liar. Let me just say to this, this to you. He cannot tell the truth. He is the father of, of lies is what the Bible says. Jesus said there is no truth in him at all. So anything he says to you is a lie. But the, one of the practices of a good liar is to share just a little bit of the truth. Just a tidbit of truth in, in it makes it really a far better lie. And here, actually, there were giants in the land. That is true. There were giants in the land. Those were Anak's kin. Those were giant people in the land. When they went in there and got the land, man, tell, you talk about a blessing. I mean, here they are sleeping on a king-sized bed made for somebody nine feet tall. I mean, how comfortable is that? The countertops and the houses were built for these giant people. How comfortable was that? I'm just saying to you that there were giants in the land, but has God ever had trouble with giants? God, God can take a, a shepherd boy with a slingshot and kill giants. God has no trouble with giants in the land. The problem was they thought they were grasshoppers, and so they were. Satan is such a good liar that he will even create false evidence to back up his lie. In the, in the Old Testament with Joseph and Jacob, you remember Jacob gives him the coat of many colors because he loves Joseph so much, which was a, why he did that. Who, what dad wouldn't know that, really? You give the, one boy a special coat and you got t 11 others, that they're, that, that's not going to cause a problem. And what boy, when he's like six years old, or maybe, maybe 10 at the most, he has these dreams about his family bowing down to him and worshiping him and being subject to him, even his mom and daddy. And then he tells them. I'm thinking, 
Joseph, come on, man. They already hate you. What is this going to do? It just reinforces it. Well, sure enough, the boys were down somewhere away from the house, and Jacob sends Joseph down and says, go check on your brothers. They've been down there a long time, see if they're all right. Joseph goes down there. When they see him coming, they say to each other, let's kill him and tell dad a wild animal got him. And Reuben said, no, let's don't kill him. Let's sell him to somebody. We, that's a road down there in Midianites, all the kind of people come by going to Egypt and so forth. Let's just, let's just sell him. Let's get some money out of him. So they throw him down in a pit. They take his little coat of many colors off. They rip it up a little bit and they pour some animal blood on it. So, and then they sell him to the Midianites and then they take the coat of many colors back to dad. And here's what they, 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 they do when they get back. They give the coat to their father, Jacob. And they say, is this Joseph's coat? Pretending they don't know anything about it. Dad, we found this out in the, out in the field. Is this, does, does this look like Joseph's coat? Dad looks at it, Jacob looks at it. And he sees the blood on it. And he sees it torn. He jumps to the conclusion that his boy has been killed and torn to pieces by a wild animal. And his brothers just let that ride. Subtle, 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 subtle. Stop believing lies. You want to win the battle? Stop believing lies. All right, let's bow our head.